everyone. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, this is this is just for the uh, for the streaming. Hopefully I'm not that quiet. Um, thanks very much for for choosing to come to um, this session. Um, as uh, Kev Moore said in the in the brief, if you do have an interest in the other sessions, they are all being streamed and you can look them up um, beyond. Um, as many times as you'd like, because they'll all be um, available there on YouTube. Um, so this session, you can see on the board, um, really happy to say that we've got Major Pat Burgess um, here today. Um, I'm going to um, stop talking in a sec uh, and hand over, but um, we're here for, for an hour session um, with a, with a Q&A at the end. Um, and then either Courtney or I will jump back on and let you know um, where we are in the program and where to go on. Um, that's enough for me. I'll hand over to Pat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, hey, lovely to see people in a room. Um, I've been doing a lot of stuff via Zoom and a lot of stuff via Teams, and it's very nice to be able to actually share space in a room to discuss this um, very misunderstood subject, which is mindfulness. Um, firstly, can I just do some really boring admin stuff? Um, mobile phones, if you've got them on you, can you please make sure they're switched to silent or to off? It may have already been done before, I just want to make sure. Um, because um, there are times during this talk, which is a very unusual talk, by the way, um, where I'll need your complete undivided attention, okay? Because we are going to do some practicing here today, okay, of mindfulness. So I'm going to need your undivided attention in a couple of areas during the talk, just for your awareness. It is interactive. It is about mindfulness, but you'll notice no tie-dye, okay? Um, no dreads. Um, so um, you know, there's no whale music, I can guarantee. And all the things that I ask you to do, you can do from the comfort of your own chairs and you can keep your footwear on too. All right? So that should hopefully set everybody's mind at ease because my role is to make mindfulness accessible to everybody because it is a hugely accessible tool, but it's just very misunderstood. Um, so if I was a bus driver and you were on the bus, um, are you all coming for a journey with me? Everyone happy to come on a journey? Okay, what I need from you, more than anything, is open minds, because I am going to challenge assumptions, beliefs, understandings as I go through this talk. I don't expect you to agree with me and completely buy into everything I say. Y this is just me sharing my point of view with you, but most of all, open minds. And where I ask you uh, to take part in the practice, if you take part in the practice, I absolutely guarantee that you will realize the benefits of it when you do so. So, without further ado, Like 55 minutes to go? I'm only kidding. <laughs> the reason I do that at the start of these talks is just so that you can get the idea of how we decide mindfulness is, how we've already decided what we think mindfulness is. There's, two, there's a couple of reasons. Firstly is, number one, hopefully the person that's booked me is now a little bit nervous because they think that I'm going to be doing lots of stuff like this. But secondly is judgment. People decide what they think mindfulness is and they judge mindfulness and have a certain perspective on it. It really is accessible to everybody. And it really is a tool that can empower you holistically throughout your whole life. Now, does anybody practice mindfulness in the room? Okay, fabulous. Does anyone want to give me a, like a definite? Oh, sorry, this is interactive, by the way, as well. So I'm going to interact with you as an audience, and hopefully you'll be able to come back with some answers as well. So does anyone have a, a, a sort of definition of mindfulness? Being mindful of your mind. So aware of your mind, would that be a fair to say? Yeah, be aware of what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah, aware of what you're thinking. yeah. yeah okay. to, be oh, to be in the moment. Brilliant, yeah. Any others? To stop and smell the coffee. Stop and smell the coffee. Nice. Okay, I'm going to give you two definitions. First one was from a guy called John Kabat-Zinn. Um, some people may be aware of him. Um, he's the guy that brought mindfulness from the East to the West. So he went and studied Buddhism, and he realized that within the, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, there was a thing called right mindfulness. He brought it back to the West and put it into a clinical setting. So at the University of Massachusetts Hospital, he set up this thing called the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Clinic. And he would teach an eight-week course on mindfulness-based stress reduction. So upstairs in the hospital, you would have 
people suffering from common psychological disorders, and if they were unable to make a therapeutic relationship with their clinician or the clinician was unable to help them in any way, shape or form, they'd send them down to the basement and John kabat would put them on his eight-week course. The results were astonishing. People were healing themselves with the skills and the tools that were being provided by John kabat -Zinn. People were taking responsibility for their own illness and healing themselves. So it's only right that he, the founding father of all of the mindfulness courses you, you'll see in the West, they're all based on his MBSR program, should start with his definition, which is paying attention to the present moment on purpose, non-judgmentally. Paying attention to the present moment on purpose, non-judgmentally. So that sounds quite simple, paying attention. Well, hopefully you're all doing that now. To the present moment, when's that? When's the present moment? Now. Do you know that very few people spend any time in the present moment? They spend nearly all their time wrapped up inside their imaginations and never really paying any attention to what's happening in the present moment right now. And we'll talk more about that as we go through. On purpose. Paying attention on purpose. There's a purpose behind it. That means there's some form of discipline involved here. Non-judgmentally. Good luck with that. You're human beings. We put things into categories very, very quickly and we judge quite quickly. Good, bad, friend, foe. Or anything that we think can harm us. We, we put all these things into categories very quick and that's how they say we've made it to the top of the food chain. Uh, it all depends on your perspective of the food chain, I guess. But we are very judgmental, um, hence the bit at the front, at the start, when you get down in that position to enable you to consider, you know, who is this person talking? A lot of people may think I'm a left-wing tree-hugging hippie from Glastonbury. Three out of four of those are accurate as well. Um, and as we go through, if we get time at the end, I'll, I'll tell you which ones, which, which ones are true and which ones are not. So that's John Kabat-Zinn's. So you can see mindfulness is not as easy as you might think. There's more to it. Um, because I deliver this talk around defence, and because I deliver it, I've been into prison with it, just to do the brief, I wasn't incarcerated, um, into schools and various other places, um, I've changed and created my own definition which runs through this talk, it's the basis of this talk. So mindfulness to me is your mind, your body, same place, same time, same focus. Your mind and your body in the same place at the same time, focused on the same thing. How often are your minds and your bodies in the same place at the same time? If you're like the majority of the population, that's a very rare experience because we spend nearly all our times, as I said before, trapped in here inside our imaginations and not paying any attention to this phenomenal, not just mine, which is fairly phenomenal, but yeah, everyone's got one, um, body, which is the host, this amazing body. Key difference between the two. The body, incapable of lying, tells you the truth. Every bit of feedback you get off the body is accurate. Your mind, oh, now that lies to you every single day. It tells you you're not good enough, tells you you're not strong enough, tells you you're not clever enough, tells you you're not good looking enough, tells you lots of things about yourself which are not necessarily true. Thoughts are not facts. They are just mental events. And mindfulness enables us to get the balance between this phenomenal instrument, the body, and the mind, and to bring them into balance with one another, and to create this thing called stasis, so we can actually see what's going on in the world around us, instead of what our mind is telling us is happening. So that's why I deliver this talk and go around defence. Now, I stumbled upon mindfulness whilst doing my degree in psychology, and I read a book by a guy called Eckhart Tolle. Has anyone ever heard of Eckhart Tolle? Yeah, got a couple, yeah. The book, The Power of Now. That book, if you haven't read it, I recommend it. Um, I don't get any royalties. Uh, that book absolutely rocked my, rocked my world, changed my as aspect on life. I thought I knew what was going on until I read that book. But he talks about being on a train in London. So firstly, establish a frame of reference. Has everybody been on a train before? Yeah? <laughs> okay, I just need to make sure. I mustn't assume. Okay, so has everybody been on an underground train before? Okay, or, or see, do you know what it looks like? Have you seen it on TV enough to know what it would, would be like to be on an underground train? So picture Eckhart Tolle on the underground train in London, a, a pre-pandemic, packed commuter train, holding onto the thing above his head, trying to stay upright, desperately trying not to touch the people around him, which is what most people are doing. I mean, there's always the odd one or two, but nearly everybody is trying desperately not to touch anyone next to them or even make eye contact with one another. And sat over in the corner is a lady. 
She's a bit dishevelled and scruffy by appearance. And she's having a conversation. And she's talking really, really quietly. And she gets really, really loud. And then she gets really, really agitated and angry. And then she gets really, really calm and happy. And she's moving from subject to subject to subject. Angry, agitated, calm, loud, quiet. No rhyme nor reason behind any of this conversation. And she's having this conversation with just herself. So people are starting to try and create some space in this already packed commuter train around this woman. Create some space for her. The train stops at the next stop. Nearly everybody exits that carriage. It's not even their stop. Does anyone know what was wrong with that woman? Does anyone have any ideas? What could be wrong? Nothing? So that's good. This is what I like. I always get two very clever answers when I go through this. The first one is she's just very intelligent and she wants some space on the train. Uh, I like it, but no, not in this case. The second one is that I always get asked, told, oh, she's on the phone, she's just got her pods in. Uh, no, not in this case either. Okay, so once we've got those two out of the way, has anyone got any other ideas what might be wrong with this woman? Uh, no, her, not them. So uh, what's, what's actually wrong with the woman? They've all left the train. What's making her do the things that she does? Hello? Yeah. She's working on her own demons in her own way. Okay, we'll come back to that. I mean, I often get answers if just to tie you along the line. Some people say maybe Tourette's. Some people say maybe psychosis. Some people say she could be paranoid. Um, it could be anxious. The reason I highlight this, or um, you know, it depends on the audience and whether people pick that up, is because we're much more aware of mental ill health than we ever were before. And we're so much more aware because we're educated about it now that we often can almost diagnose whilst watching somebody's behaviour and go, ah, oh, that might be what's wrong with that person. So that's why I raise it, and that's just a, just a big champion. It's great that we're starting to understand these things, because when I was young, we only had one three-letter word to encapsulate all of that. And because I'm that little bit advanced in my ears, I'm going to use it. So everybody on that train looked at that woman and thought she was mad. Because in the difference between her and them, they thought she was acting out of the norm. So they thought she was mad. What's the difference between her and you? What, what is she doing that you don't? She's vocalising her thoughts. Because I would argue that inside your heads every day you have multiple different conversations going on with multiple voices. Some of them are loud, some of them are quiet, some of them are angry, some of them are calm, some of them are agitated, and there's very little rhyme nor reason between them. Constantly going on in your head every day. She vocalises, you don't. Who's mad? We're all a little bit crazy. The lunatic has taken over the asylum. The mind is running the show. And this doesn't have to be the case. We can control our minds. It's ours. Mindfulness is a very simple set of skills that you can learn to enable you to regain control of the phenomenal instrument. Now, this talk comes with two news flashes. First one, news flash minor, I'm going to deliver to you in about three or four seconds' time. Well, it'd be longer than that. But the second one that I'm going to deliver to you later on in the talk. I'm going to deliver a sentence later that could change your life forever. It is so powerful, it could change the way you view and perceive your world forever. Now, I'm not delivering that now. That's my hook to keep you in the room. I'll deliver that later on. But the first sentence is still very important. You are not your mind. You are not your mind. Your mind is a tool for you to use. You own it. It does not own you. You can control it. It does not control you. Unfortunately, the majority of the population think that the mind is in charge of them and are completely unaware of how to control it. Now, I'm not belittling the mind in any way. Please don't get me wrong. This mind is the most powerful instrument that's ever been created. You can build with it, plan with it, create with it, imagine with it. You can do all sorts of phenomenal things with it. In fact, it is so powerful that it contains your entire universe. That is how powerful your mind is. But you own it. It doesn't own you. You can control it. It doesn't have to control you. And I'm going to take you through a practice in a moment after I've led you into it, just to show you how easy it can be to control your mind. Some very simple, simple steps to bring it under your control. 
but we're going to have to do a practice first. So I'm going to lead you into the practice with a scenario, because I like to talk. You might be getting used to the idea of that now. And then once I've led you into the scenario, then we're going to go into the practice and, and take it really, really simply. Now, in a moment, what I want you to do is to imagine that you're a cat. Meow! That's me being a cat. Do you see that? That's like watching a Lambda-trained actor burst on the stage and get into role immediately in front of your eyes. People pay thousands for that, and you got that for free, just in case you missed it. Meow! That's me being a cat, right? And the cat is at a mouse hole. What's the cat doing at a mouse hole? Why is he there? Waiting for a mouse. What's he going to do when the mouse comes out? Kill it? What, what's, the what's the action? Pounce. Fabulous. Thank you very much. In a moment, I want you to be the mouse. A uh, cat, sorry. Ready to pounce on your mouse. But the mouse for you is the very first thought that pops into your head. Okay, that's the over explanation bit over, you'll be pleased to know. I'm now going to make it really, really simple. What I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is to all close your eyes. Not right now, in a moment. And then I want you to wait for the very first thought to pop into your head. And when it pops into your head, I want you to spring your eyes open like you're the cat that caught the mouse. I don't want to know the content. Genuinely, I don't want to know the content. I just want you to close your eyes, and when the first thought pops into your head, just spring your eyes open. Is everybody happy with the instructions? Okay, everybody close your eyes. When the first thought pops into your head, spring your eyes open. If you're sleeping, it doesn't count. And if you heard my voice, there's a really good chance you had a thought. And if you haven't already done so, please open your eyes. What normally happens in the first five to ten seconds is everybody's eyes spring open, and that's quite slow. You're doing something unusual. You're watching your thoughts. Harvard University claimed that we have 60,000 thoughts a day going through our head. 60,000 thoughts a day going through our head. They've put a percentage on how many of those thoughts are productive. And by productive, I mean the thought leads to a product, an outcome, something tangible. Anyone like to hazard a guess what the percentage is of, of useful, productive thoughts going around your head every day? Three, pretty low, less than one, 0.5, and it's like a game show, higher, lower. Anyone want to go above like three? Three's the highest I've got at the moment. So the highest I've got at the moment is three. Are we happy with that in the room? Firstly, self-reflection time. You're saying that 97% of your thoughts every day are completely wasted? That's quite an interesting thing to, to be aware of. Harvard actually claimed that 40, 40% 40 of your thoughts are productive. Now, before we all congratulate ourselves on being so clever, I think Harvard are talking about themselves because uh, they think they're clever. Um, I would like to say that we're closer to 10%, probably 10% of our thoughts every day are productive thoughts, and the rest, as you've already identified, a wasted psychological activity. Now, the interesting thing about psychological activity and physiological activity, the mind and the body are two sides of the same coin. Everything that happens in the mind has an effect in the body. Anything that happens in the body has an effect on the mind. So if you're wasting 90% of your psychological activity, that is also having an effect on your body physiologically. Because we live in a current society where a lot of the input that we're receiving through the media, through all of the mediums of the things that we interact with, is quite negative. And that creates a change in our bodies too, because if we hear something terrible is happening over the other side of the world, it will change our heart rate, it will change our breathing. Um, it, and if we're starting to worry about things that might happen in the future, it changes the way our physiology is. We, we almost go into fight, flight and freeze response just based on thoughts. So 90% physiological activity is also being wasted going into fight, flight, and freeze. Now, if a bear walked out in front of you in Bovington, like jumped out in front of you on the street, you would immediately go into fight, flight, or freeze without needing to use your mind, your brain, or anything to do it. It would be an automatic survival response. And you would therefore discharge that energy. If you do it by a thought, there's no way of discharging the energy. And it gets trapped inside the body. And the more and the more it happens, the more and the more it builds up. And it can make people quite ill in the end. Again, the reasoning that mindfulness is so, such a clever and useful skill to own. Such an amazing capability. Because let's get off the bus, get off the train, and let's put ourselves into our cars on our way into work. For, oh, hold on, another assumption. Everybody drive? No? 
Do you know what it's like to be in a car, though, on a, on a journey? Yeah, fantastic. OK, so let's go into it, get into a car now on our way to work, right? And we're late for work. OK, so we're in a car and we're on our way to work in the morning and we're late. We're going to be about five minutes late. Now, I've had a little look around this room and I can tell that you're all law abiding citizens. I can also tell that you're all keen, conscientious drivers. So you're late for work, but you're on a dual carriageway and it's got a central reservation, which means there's a 70 miles per hour speed limit, but you're not going to break that speed limit. Even though you know you're late for work, you're conscientious, well-behaved drivers, so you're keeping to your 70 miles an hour. And then a sign comes up, road works ahead, two lanes going into one. Again, conscientious, like I've said, law-abiding citizens. So you have a little look in your mirror, and you think the only way to make this work is if we all come into one lane and then we flow through there and there'll be no bottlenecks, it'll all be nice and easy. So you indicate left and move into the inside lane. And you look in your mirror, your rear view mirror, and nearly everyone's doing the same as you. So you're feeling quite good about that, congratulating yourselves and them. Then you have a little look in your wing mirror. You see a car pulls out from the inside lane right at the back and is racing down the outside lane to get ahead of everybody else. You might notice your fists starting to clench on the steering wheel. Your heart rate might have changed a bit, your breathing. You do a quick time of motion study and realise that by the time you arrive at the intersection of those two lanes, that car and you will come at the same time. You'll be there at the same time. I'm not letting them in. There's absolutely no way I'm going to let them in. How dare they be so rude? Everybody else is behaving. Everyone else is playing the game. That car, oh no, thinks they can get ahead of it. There's no way I'm letting them in. Not a chance. Heart rate's now going up. Breathing's getting a little bit faster. You were right. At the time of intersection, that car arrives, but it gets there just before you and cuts across in front of you, causing you to dab your brakes. Rage is the only word I can use to explain how you were feeling at that moment in time. Absolutely furious. How dare that car pull across in front of me? How dare it go down the outside lane when everyone else is behaving themselves, beeping your horn, gesticulating out the window, deciding what you're going to catch up with that car. I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. I might even drag them out of the car and beat them to a pulp. All of this is going on like this rage is enveloping you, all this anger rising in front of you, right inside you. What if I was to tell you that the anger you're experiencing actually only lasts for a fraction of a second? The emotion that you're generating moves in waves and it only lasts for a very short period of time. The only thing that keeps it alive is the story that you tell it about how unfair that is, how dare they do such a thing, how, why would they do that, I can't believe they'd be so, I'm going to get after them, I'm going to chase them. All you're doing at this moment in time is putting fuel on a fire, loading it and loading it. And the more fuel you put on, the, the brighter and brighter it blazes. Interesting thing about fire. The very first thing it consumes, the vessel that it starts in. So the only person that's getting hurt at that moment in time is you. As you flood your body with toxins, rage and anger, and it's all internal. And the only person that's getting any pain is you. Another interesting thing about this feeling of rage, because you've gone into fight, flight and freeze, fight in this case, when you go into any one of those three, you lose two vital parts of your brain function. You lose the prefrontal cortex, which is the appropriate decision making part, and you also lose access to the memory. So all of this happening in that split second, I'm about to teach you a technique that can take you out of that in really short order to bring us back and to establish some kind of stasis and balance. Now I'm going to give you some really simple instructions and then I'm just going to ask you to follow me through a practice. Like I said at the start of this, if you do this, if you carry out the practice and, and give it a go, I, I guarantee that you will experience the benefits of the practice. If it's not your thing though, just feel free to just sit quietly and allow me to talk through it, that's cool. As long as you're not nudging the person next to you, that'll be fine. <laughs> okay, super job. So. Slight change of posture. So feet planted firmly on the ground. Uh, but I want you to sit forward in your chairs if, you, if it's at all possible. What I want to see is a, a posture of dignified attention. So we're falling awake, not falling asleep. Our heads are up, like not forehead up. It's like you've got a bit of string attached to the top of the head. Arms and shoulders are nice and relaxed. And your hands can be in your lap or wherever they're comfortable or crossed. Makes no difference where they are as long as the, that part of you is relaxed, but you're upright. There's a reason behind the posture. Very important reason behind the posture. 
when your body tells your mind that it's paying attention, that it's awake, your, your body, your mind will respond by paying attention. If your body slouches back into a chair, your mind will slouch too, and then just go off on its normal ramblings. So it's very important that we maintain this posture. So this posture, and if you're comfortable, I'd like you to close your eyes, and I'm going to talk you through a practice. If you're not comfortable with your eyes closed, just adopt a soft focus just in front of you as we turn our attention to our breathing. So where the air is coming in through the nose and the mouth. The contact with the back of the throat. The rise and the fall of the chest. And the rise and the fall of the abdomen, the belly. All of our attention focused on our breathing, not trying to breathe. Your body has been breathing without your input for your entire life. Become the observer of the physical feelings and sensations of breathing. As you notice, where the air comes in through the nostrils or the lips. If it's coming in through the nostrils, it might be coming more at the left nostril than the right. It might be an equal flow. As it bypasses the lips and goes into the mouth, if you're breathing through the mouth, past the teeth and the tongue. Then there's that contact with the back of the throat. And then as the lungs fill, the chest starts to rise, the belly pushes out. And at the end of the in-breath, there's a slight space, a gap. And then the reverse of the process happens. As the lungs empty, the belly and the chest flatten. And the slightly warmer air exits via the nostril or the mouth. And then there's another slight gap. And the whole process happens all over again. All of your attention focused there. Now your mind will want to distract you. Things that may have happened earlier on today, things that might happen later on, things that may be happening in the room around you. When you notice that your mind is doing that, don't give yourself a hard time. But just guide your attention back to the physical feelings and sensations, specifically now in the area of the belly, the abdomen and aware of it as it rises and falls in conjunction with your breath. All of your attention there may be gurgling, may just be the touch of the belly against the clothing as it rises and falls. And on the next out breath, we're gonna send our attention down through the hips, down through the legs, and all the way down to where our feet are in contact with the floor, noticing that contact, that touch between your feet through your footwear and the floor. You might start to notice a tingling sensation in your feet. You might notice heat or cold. You might just be aware of the contact with your feet, socks and footwear. And even if you're aware of none of those things, as long as you're aware of the location of your feet in relation to the rest of your body without looking, as long as you can feel your feet, then that's enough. Again, your mind will want to distract you and guide you elsewhere. And if it does it a hundred times, gently guide it back under your control a hundred times as we leave the feet behind, travel up through the legs to where our backsides are in contact with the seat the cushion of the chair that you're sat on. Aware of the downward pressure that gravity is exerting on you to keep you in place on the planet, to stop you flying out into space. Feeling that pressure down through your body, right the way down to where the two sit bones, one on each cheek, are contacting through the skin, the surface of the chair. All of your attention there. Again, the mind, like a child or a puppy will be tugging at your sleeve trying to get your attention to summit that it thinks is more interesting or exciting when you notice and noticing is the key just smile gently and guide your attention back to the physical feelings and sensations as we leave the backside behind travel up through the spine across the shoulders 
and down through the arms and into the super sensitive hands. One of the most sensitive parts of the body. You may start to feel a tingling sensation from the palms of your hand through the tips of your thumbs and fingers. Again, you may feel heat or cold or the contact of hand on hand or hand and leg. And again, if nothing, as long as you're aware of the location of your hands without looking, as long as you can feel them, that's enough. And if you notice the mind trying to distract you again, when you notice, no judgment, just smile gently and guide it back as we leave the hands behind and travel to the outer extremities of the body, the skin. Feeling where our skin comes into contact with our clothing and the outside air. That subtle touch of fabric on skin and temperature change against the exposed skin. Aware of the space that your body inhabits, noticing its edges. And again, aware of the mind if it's trying to distract you. And guiding it gently back with a smile when you notice as we leave the skin behind and travel back into the hands. And from the hands to the backside. And from the backside down through the legs to the feet. And the feet back up through the legs to the abdomen. The rise and the fall of the chest. The in-breath and the out-breath. And in a moment, I'm going to ask you to open your eyes. And when I do, just bring that feeling of inhabiting the body into the room as we open our eyes and we end the practice and open your eyes. How was that? Hopefully that was relaxing. You may have noticed a change in your heart rate, a change in your breathing as it all starts to calm down. That's how the human body should feel at rest. That's the balance between body and mind, is stasis. The, the mind is no longer agitating you and telling you that stuff's happening that the body feels it needs to react to. You bring them into balance with one another, that stasis, and that's what rest should feel like. Very few people have the opportunity to experience that level of rest, but it's our natural resting state. Did everyone notice their minds, though? Trying to take their attention away elsewhere as we were going through. Some cultures call it the monkey mind, some call it the runaway elephant, some call it the runaway horse. There's one thing for sure, those 60,000 thoughts are very powerful, Paul. Did you all, though, if only for a fraction of a second, were you all able to bring your mind under your control and focus it on the part of the body I was talking about? It, it may well have gone away straight afterward, but were you all able to achieve it, at least to focus attention on the part of the body? Well, then congratulations, you bunch of hippies, because you just meditated. <laughs> That is the principle of meditation. Your mind, your body, same place, same time, same focus. Your mind was trying to take you somewhere else. You noticed it. You brought it back under your control and focused it on a part of the body. It tried to go away again. You noticed, brought it back again. Backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. The more and the more you do it, the easier and the easier it becomes. And then you gain this incredible thing between stimulus and reaction. The stimulus being the thought, the reaction being the sensations in the body. And in between them, there's this thing called peace. And I don't know anyone who ain't just looking for a little bit of peace. Will my mind shut up for a couple of minutes, please, and give me a little bit of peace and quiet? And you can achieve that by practicing this particular thing. Now, it's called practicing for a reason. It's not easy, but the more and the more you do it, the easier it becomes. I want you to imagine well, you walk through a field, you open the gate, and no one's ever trampled on the grass before. And you walk across the grass, and you turn around and have a look behind you, and you'll see a very faint trace where you've walked. If you keep walking backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards across the same piece of grass, you'll eventually create a pathway. 
It's exactly what happens in your brain when you carry out repetitive activity like this meditation practice. You create new neural pathways via neuroplasticity. And the more and the more you do it, the easier it is to get into the state of calm and relaxation. So it does take practice and discipline, but the results are phenomenal. Now, I said you could do this in the car. Don't close your eyes. <laughs> Whatever you do, that could be fatal. But you can, in that situation, when you can feel those thoughts and that rage rising, start to pay attention to your body. Where are my hands? They're on the steering wheel. Where's my backside? It's on the seat. Where are my feet? They're on the pedals. I'm inside a car and I'm perfectly safe. I am not in a need to fight. Then you break the chain between the stimulus and the reaction. Stasis is allowed to happen. And then you have access to your prefrontal cortex and your memory. Suddenly, we can make appropriate responses. And we might realize that chasing after that car and dragging that person out and giving them a piece of our mind is a bad idea because it could be someone rushing somebody to hospital. It could just be someone like you that's late for work. Let's not say you've never done it before. Or it could be Mike Tyson. And then it'd be a really bad move. Okay, so getting that appropriate response back and that ability is important. So there's a freebie, like a great technique that you can take away with you. And it's not just useful for in cars. If anyone does further education, study, turn over the page uh, of your exams. You sat in exam conditions, you turn over the page, read the first line, first question. I have absolutely no idea what that what question is asking me. I've been studying this subject for about the last six months and I've never seen that question before. What's actually happening there is you've gone into freeze mode because you're petrified by some writing on a piece of paper. I just want to run that by you again. You're petrified by some writing on a piece of paper and it's put you into survival mode. Quick contact point meditation. Close your eyes. Breathing, feet, backside, hands, skin, back in the opposite direction, stasis re-established, re open your eyes, look at the question again, you will have the answer. I guarantee it, because you're out of freeze mode. That's not a shortcut to revision, by the way. You still have to do the revision first to put the information in there, but it's a skill that you can use. And anything in life that's a challenge, anything that you decide is a challenge, you know, like going to the doctors, going to the dentist, um, anything that you can see in front of you that you're worried about, it's just your mind telling you a story and agitating you. You can use that contact point meditation to re-establish balance and bring you into the present moment. The sentence. Do you remember I said I was going to deliver you a sentence? Most, not like a life sentence. But a statement that is so powerful that it could change the way you view your life forever. I deliver this um, talk all over, as I've said, and I go up to um, the Army uh, School of Music, so CAMUS, Corps of Army Musicians, and um, stood up on the stage at their delivering. And I, I often used to say before I delivered it, if I had a set of drums, I would do a drum roll before I delivered this sentence because it's so important. And I looked behind me, and on the stage was a full percussion set. So I jumped up onto the stage and got behind the kettle drums, gave them a good drum roll before I delivered this sentence because this genuinely is such a powerful and important sentence. Have I got your attention yet? I hope so. If you're going to fall asleep at any stage during my talk, not right now, okay? This is, this is the biggie, all right? This is the signature moment, all right? Is everyone ready? Whew, okay, I have to build myself up, take some, take some delivery, this does. Okay, right, I'm ready. You look ready, okay. You only live now. You look underwhelmed by that statement. <laughs> you only live now. Right now, right this second, is the only second you can possibly live. Nothing happens outside of this present moment. It is physically impossible. The future is a figment of, imag of your imagination and you create it. The past is just your perception of events that have been. Now, that's not to say that you weren't there. But when you were, it was in the present moment. When you look back on it, it's just your perception of the events that have been, and don't be surprised if it differs from somebody else's. You only live right now, right here, right this moment. Admittedly, it's an evolving moment that moves with you throughout your entire life, but it's only ever now. It's impossible not to be in the now. Now, that does take a little bit of mind-bending, so I'm going to help you. We'll start with the past. 
There was a fantastic experiment carried out at City University in London. They brought in a load of postgraduate students and they sat them down behind computers to do um, psychometric tests, which is like hand-eye coordination and response to stuff happening on a screen. So they're carrying out their psychometric tests. And at lunchtime, the tutor comes in and says, because you've been such great students, we're going to take you to the pub for lunch to celebrate, obviously pre-pandemic. And everyone's like, ooh, really excited. This is where the real experiment's about to happen. So they all go down to the pub. They enter the pub, and they're all sat round in a horseshoe shape, like a semicircle with a perfect view of the bar. They've all ordered their food, and they're just having a natter with one another. As I've said, this is where the real experiment's about to happen. So they're having a chat. Two not-so-gentle gentlemen walk into the pub that have an altercation with one another, which tools and turns into a full-blown fight. I am talking eight minutes of frantic physical activity. There were teeth, elbows, fists, heads, knees, the works, all going into this massive scuffle. Everybody in that group has got a perfect view of what's going on. Inside their group, there was a stooge that's been planted. They've just got to say one word in the middle of the fight. Knife! That's all they do. The fight finishes. The two not-so-gentle gentlemen leave the pub, and the police immediately burst onto the scene and segregate everybody for eyewitness interviews. Not one person told the same story as the person next to them about the fight. There were subtle differences in everybody's recount of what had happened. Some people even said there was a knife present when there wasn't. You're watching the same brief but you're all seeing something slightly different to the person next to you, because unless you're siblings or f family related, you have a different biological upbringing. Unless you come from the same house and the same street, went to the same school, you have a different environmental upbringing. And if even those two things are accurate, you've all experienced different things to the people next to you. And so you have a different experiential upbringing. So it changes the way you view your world. And I'm narrowing on purpose. Because you see the world through your eyes based on your biology, your environment, and your experiences. So going back to the fight in the pub then, who was telling the truth? Correct. They were all telling the truth. They were telling their truth. There's a fabulous saying, there is no such thing as truth. There is only perspective, your perspective. And when you look back on the past events, you are just looking at your version of events and don't be surprised if it differs from other people's. So that's the past. Moving to the future. Wake up in the morning, toothpaste on the toothbrush, brushing the teeth. Manual, electric. I used to do that for fun. That's my own visual humour, just to keep myself um, entertained. So whilst brushing our teeth in the morning, though, and looking in the mirror, um, what else are we doing? What else is normally happening at this time? Now, don't say squats. Some people have said that they do squats whilst doing that as well, which I think is a bit strange. But what else, what else is happening? Planning your, day. planning your day. Brilliant. OK, so you start planning and thinking about what's going to happen that day. Anyone play movies in their own head where they're in the starving role? Starring role you know, sort of, uh, I got this, I'm going to have this, alt this meeting with someone. There might be a bit of an altercation. I might get a bit agitated. There might be some chest poking, heart rate changes, breathing changes. And then I'm going to meet someone I haven't seen for ages. I can't wait to meet him. I love him. It's been so long. It's wonderful. You get flooded by these lovely feelings. All of this going on inside here whilst brushing your teeth in the morning. I'm amazed anyone ever makes it out of the bathroom in the morning. But if you had the presence of mind to wipe away the toothpaste and to write down each thing you thought was going to happen that day, the way you thought it was going to happen, and the outcomes, and then came back in the evening to have a look at that list, how many of those things would be accurate? It would be a very small percentage, if any at all, because the future is a figment of your imagination you create it. So, if the future is a figment of your imagination and you create it, and the past is just your perception of events that have been, and you only live now, right now, right here, right this second, it's the only second you can possibly live, who's got any problems? <laughs> Nobody. We create them for ourselves. Now, that's not to say we don't meet challenging circumstances throughout our lives. We do. But when we meet them, we meet them in the present moment.
and we go round them, through them, under them, over them, however it takes to overcome that problem. No one in this room has experienced an issue, a problem that they've been unable to overcome because otherwise you wouldn't be in the room. The issue arises when we decide that there's a problem in front of us in the future, forecasting with our imagination, and then we search for a reference point to what that's going to be like, and the only place we can go? The past. So we go to the past to find something that matches that, and all we're constantly doing is throwing past experiences in front of us and constantly reliving the past and never experiencing the only moment we've been given, that novel, single moment. That saying that history repeats itself? Of course it does. We keep bloody making it repeat itself because we're constantly throwing the past in front of us and constantly deciding that our day is going to be a certain way. Now, my wife wakes up in the morning, opens the curtains, and if it's a rainy day, she turns to me and she says, God, it's a miserable day out there. And I wait for the response, which is normally a slap, when I respond and say, the weather is just the weather, my dear. It's you that's bloody miserable. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've been married for nearly 30 years, which is a miracle all on its own. But the point is, weather's just weather. The rain just rains. It doesn't have an intention. It doesn't have a mood. It is just rain. If it didn't rain, nothing would grow. The sun is not beautiful, wonderful, or glorious. It's just the sun. It shines. If you've been to Australia during bushfire season, I can tell you now the sun is not beautiful, glorious, or wonderful. But we place the labels and the judgments on the things in our lives and then decide they're going to be a certain way. If you wake up in the morning and it's raining and, you, and it's a miserable day, how do you reckon your day's going to go? You, we have the control, the ability to control that. Now, I'm not talking positive psychology in the terms of, God, it's a gorgeous day, I'm so handsome and this is going to be amazing. I'm not talking that, okay? Genuinely not, because that is creating a pole, a polar opposite. Life doesn't work on continuums. It doesn't work on like one side and another side. It works in cycles. So if you reach the end of a cycle, it's going to overbalance and then create a cycle. I'm talking about seeing what's actually there. I'm talking about removing the labels and the judgments and actually seeing what is happening in the present moment. And when you do that, you will be truly astonished by what you see. This life is phenomenal. It is incredible. You cannot write the script. You wake up one morning and you're surrounded by stuff. You're not even present at your birth. Who remembers? You, you wake up one morning and you're surrounded by stuff in an environment that works everything out for itself. The sun shines, it rains, things grow. Things eat the things that grow. We eat the things that eat the things that grow. And all this is happening without our input in this body, this phenomenal vessel that is so complex. It breathes for us. It does everything for us. And even if you cut it, it heals itself. And we miss it. We miss it every single day, forecasting into a future or going back into a past and missing the actual experience of life. I mean, I'll use a, an example of a meeting. If people are going to go and meet someone somewhere and they have to travel through an outside space to get to that meeting, for example, um, on their way, Nearly all of their time spent inside here thinking about what the meeting is going to be like, who they're going to be sat next to, what are the points that they've got to get across, what are the other people likely to say, and as they sort of work their way through that meeting, then they get into the meeting itself, they're not there, they're gone. They're going on to the next meeting, or what's going to happen this evening for tea, or where am I going at the weekend, and very little time spent in that present moment, constantly forecasting away from it. What is wrong with now? What is wrong with this present moment? It's the only moment you ever get. There literally is no rehearsal. Now, I've got in trouble for this once before, so please don't take me literally, but I think there is a judgment day at the end of all of this. And it was a, it was a, um, a Catholic minister who took me to task on this one, because um, I said I believed that there was a judgment day and he had a right old go at me. But I, 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 still, th I still hold it. I think you do, there at the end of this life, you walk into this massive room and there's a huge mirror and you get to ask the question, how did I do? How did I get on? Well, if you spent nearly all your life 
forecasting into a future that was a figment of your imagination or into a past that was just your perception of events and never actually experiencing the only moment you were given, I think you might have wasted your lives. So that sentence, that silly little sentence, you only live now, that's why it's so important. That's why it's so powerful. Turn up for your lives. Live them. Experience that present moment. Everything you do, be there. Not forecasting off into a future that's out of your control. Your mind just taking you away there. When you make a cup of tea, pour in the water, watch the color change, smell the aromas, stir the tea, taste it, not just the first taste, and then when you've finished it, wonder, where the hell did that cup of tea go? Try tasting it, the flavors of it. When you're doing routine, mundane activities like brushing your teeth, rather than letting the brain go off ahead and do all this stuff for you, actually pay attention to the taste of the toothpaste, the water, the sensations, the smells, the five senses that you can use, that you can tie in, and be aware of them. I mean, even I would hazard, you try it when you're making love, it's amazing. Actually try being there, instead of like forecasting after what you're doing in the shopping or what's going on afterwards. You know? So what I'm saying is you're, you're, you've got these f this phenomenal five senses that you can tie into. And if you tie into them and are aware of the mind, you can bring them to bear and you'll be amazed at what you can achieve. And when you start doing that, you'll realize if and when you're making choices in your life that aren't particularly helpful for you. Instead of letting the mind take you away, it ties you into the real you. So like I said, it's a really, like the, s the sentence itself seems like a really silly sentence, but it is just a hugely important sentence to consider. And mindfulness enables us to do that. Mindfulness enables us to come into the present moment by noticing when our mind is taking us away somewhere else by noticing where it's taken us, and then exercising the one thing that we've got, choice. If you don't pay attention to that thought, the world doesn't end. Another one will replace it. And another one, and another one, and another one. Those 60,000 thoughts. The only things that give those thoughts any power is your attention, so choose wisely. We're not fighting our minds. We're not repressing anything. We're not trying to push stuff down. We're noticing our minds and watching its repetitive actions. You know, of the 90% of those thoughts, Harvard University claim that 90% of them are the same thoughts as the day before and the day before and the day before and the day before. And they're on a massive carousel just constantly spinning around. The only thing that makes a change in your day is the ones you shine a light through, the ones you pay attention to. So choose wisely and bring your mind to bear under your control. And then, like I say, you'll be amazed at what you can achieve. I mean, stress is a big issue. I'm just going to touch on this briefly. Stre stress is a big issue that people um, suffer from, and people talk about managing stress. I mean, why would you want to manage stress? But people talk about managing it. Best thing to do with stress is to view it as an ironing pile. That's the way I view it. So, take off the top item from your ironing pile, put it on the ironing board. Did you see how big my ironing pile was, by the way? <laughs> it's right up here. <laughs> so you take off a shirt, you start ironing one arm, and then you take off a pair of trousers, and you start on a leg, and then you take off a underwear and start ironing your underwear. Just, just me with the underwear. Yeah, and then you take off a sock, definitely just me, and you put a crease down the front of it. What I'm trying to get at here, before long you've got an ironing board full of unfinished clothes. You don't do that with your ironing. You do one thing at a time, and then you place it away. And then you do another one, and you place it away. And then you get this amazing thing called closure. Lovely American word, closure. And a sense of achievement, because you've, you've done something. You can see it there. The principle of Zen. Do one thing at a time. One thing at a time. And do it with your whole being. And when you do that, you'll be amazed at the response of what you do. Multitasking biggest corporate lie ever sold. All it does is divide up your attention into salami slices. 
and then you end up with 10 things going on at once with 10% of your attention on each one. And the outcomes are only 10 percenters. But if you can focus all your attention on one thing and do the best you can of that one thing and put your everything into it, you'll be incredibly surprised at what the outcome can be. So that neatly brings us to five minutes before the end. See, I saw you going to lift, going to lift the hand thing up to tell me. So five minutes before the end. So this is where um, I'm going to stop talking for a bit and, um, and open up the floor um, for you to question. So, um, uh, and if you want to disagree with anything I say, or and I'm also really, really comfortable with that too. I'm very used to it, if I'm honest. Um, so, um, so please, the floor is yours. Any questions? Can yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for goal setting and envisaging where you're going to get to? Yeah, that's... Is, is, that a, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? That's... That's a that's a that's a really good question and a common question that I get asked when I do this talk and um, and I probably need to factor it better into my talk. But although it's nice to get the question at the end though, um, so um, I did say that, th that you own your mind and you control your mind and you can build with it, you can plan with it, you can create with it, you can imagine with it, you can do all sorts of wonderful things with it. The key is you own it; it doesn't own you. So when you bring your mind to bear to plan. As long as you're controlling it and it's not leading you off and distracting you on a tangent, you will plan amazingly. Visualization seems like an unusual bedfellow to come with mindfulness, but if you're using your mind to visualize and it's under your control, you can use it. I'm not talking about um, you know, walking out your door every day and just going, where's the universe going to take me today? And just like skipping out into the sunlight and, um, and seeing where you end up. I'm not, and that's not to take the mickey. But what, what I mean is um, bring the mind under your control. Watch when it's distracting you. Watch when it's on an automatic thought. It's a miserable day. Oh, this is going to be terrible. That's going to be terrible. No, acknowledge that's what it's doing. Let those thoughts go. Bring it under your focus and control. And then your planning will be incredible. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We learn from sort of past experiences as well. We do, so yes. We do have to bring things to the front of our minds so that have happened in the past. Yeah, that, that's true. So very similar to that question there. Again, we're using our mind. So, so we're using our mind for our purposes. So we're allowing ourselves to plan, to create, to do what we need to based on things that we've already experienced. But we're not letting our mind tell us that that person's doing this terrible thing to us. But I can't believe they would do that. I can't make us like, go into a fight, flight or freeze when we don't need to. Because in that moment, we're perfectly safe. We're perfectly in control. What happens is we've got this thing called the amygdala in the brain, which is constantly scanning for threats. And, and it's been around since we were first um, created. And, and it's always on the lookout for threats. But we're not in a situation where we're likely to be threatened because of the pos our position in society. But it's very difficult to turn that off. We don't want to repress it, because if we do, it can manifest itself into something else. So we just need to be aware of it and noticing when we're trying to be distracted. But using our past experiences to shape our, our current life, there's nothing wrong with that. But it is about controlling your mind, not letting your mind control you. That's, that's the message. And using those really simple practices over and over and over again, those really simple c can bring your mind to bear and create that space around you so you're not being constantly distracted on automatic thinking. Is that okay? Yeah, no worries. Yes? So, uh, we have been I'm uh, from the House of Calvary and we have, I've ha we've had you over yeah. to talk to us. Uh -huh. And I was just wondering, is there anything that we can sort of have in place, like almost like we have sports afternoon where we have a, yeah. bit, a lot of time to go and weigh and enjoy ourselves. Is there any sort of future in the army of having a bit of time for mindfulness? I wish. Day? Yeah, I wish. Um, I, I, and that's my goal. That's why I do these talks. This is not all I do. So I, so I, I do these talks, but I've also created an online um, eight-week mindfulness course that anyone can get access to. You be you civilian, be you military, be you civil servant, contractor, whatever you are. If you typed into Google British Army mindfulness course, you would find my eight-week course come up. And you can go on that, take it at your own pace, at your own time. It's an explainer of what mindfulness is. And then you can go through the course at your own pace. Okay, So that's available. 
possible. I deliver Zoom courses to Defence, so I advertise it on Defence, and then on a Thursday, normally 11.30 till 12.30, I will run an eight-week course um, where I take people through. The strength of that is that we get um, gr to work as a group on Zoom and people can reflect back on the practices that we've done and the homework that we've done because it's, it's like an hour of tuition and then 20 minutes of um, practice that you have to do as homework every night. And then you get to reflect back and everyone learns from each other. Then I deliver physical courses too. But my key one for bringing it into defense in general is I'm trying to bring it into physical training via a thing called physical attention training. I want to teach our physical training instructors to bring mindfulness into physical training. And I've done two pilots down here, down at the Armour Centre. I've been running courses, three or four courses now, where I'm teaching physical training instructors. Firstly, they do the eight-week course, so they understand what they're teaching. I won't let anybody near it until they understand mindfulness. Once they understand mindfulness, then I teach them the techniques and they deliver it to their students. And it has an incredible effect on people. It's almost building it into the, the structure that's already there, and it just enhances the, the capability. It just makes us better human beings. Does that kind does that answer? Because I'm, but the heart, the challenge, is getting somebody to endorse that, and that's where I've hit a brick wall. Army headquarters, well, me, me, many places I've gone and bumped into, and 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 it's just trying to get somebody to go. Okay, I'll do that. We'll, we'll we'll do that. Let's invest in it and let's make it happen. So I'm sort of doing it from the bottom up at the moment. It will happen. I know it will. Thank, thanks for the question. Any other questions? Uh, then just leaves to me to say, what an audience you were, by the way. Um, th <laughs> no, thank you ever so much. Thanks ever so much for your time um, and attention during that. Uh, and I hope it was of use to you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here at the Tank Museum. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. And if anyone wants a chat, carry on. <laughs>